visiting media fellow at the Center for Tech Diplomacy out of Purdue University. And um, I think I think we just dropped someone, but when he rejoins, um, we'll, we'll uh, I guess we're still, we're coming out of the pandemic, but we're still having to deal with these these panel times. So why don't we just go around and Robin, I'll start with you. If, if you could say your name, what uh, you do and, sure. and, and really why you were drawn to this particular conversation. Sure. Um, and then we'll wait for Apu to join as well. Go ahead. Sure. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I love Kevin. He always keeps it light and fun. So that's what you've got going on for this panel. Um, my name is Robin Rich and I'm the president and publisher at Deseret News. And what was really interesting to me about this panel, um, so Deseret News is an organization that's been around for 171 years and uh, in the newspaper industry. And um, we've kind of switched in the last year and a half to be a little bit more of a national uh, platform. And the reason for that is we really kind of saw in the media that there was more of a need for journalism kind of in the center right, especially here in the United States. There, there was a large group on, on the far right, and there isn't really anybody trying to moderate and be center right. Um, and so as we've done that, um, we've really seen our readership grow as we're just trying to be, um, you know, reasonable discussions that we can convene some solutions versus hysteria. Um, and I am in a luxury position that um, we have, the business models kind of cause that, frankly. Um, that's why it's like that. But I'm in a luxury position. I'm not having to, I have a really patient funder, so I don't actually have to be hysterical to that's grow amazing. the business. That's rare too. The, <laughs> yeah. What's patient? Well, I don't have to be hysterical to grow the business. I can actually just deliver good content and get lots of people to write for us. Um, and that's been really great to see. Um, the conversations that end up happening if you're getting bringing the center under a represented group here in the United States together. No. That's it. That's my spiel. <laughs> Great. What Lisa, what, what, tell us your story and, and what you do. Yeah. Um, so Lisa Kaplan, I'm the founder and CEO of Aletheia Group. We are a company that detects and mitigates instances of disinformation, misinformation, and social media manipulation. Um, I was drawn by this panel because um, a lot of the work that we do is really focused on how is information disseminated? How are algorithmic biases potentially distorting the information that we see day to day um, in, our, in our news feeds? How are we consuming information? And then how are nefarious actors potentially exploiting these technologies that are now... Um, um, enabling us to be able to access um, access both, you know, reputable news sources and less reputable news sources um, or completely unverified sources. And what does that mean for our ability to be able to understand what's happening out in the world and make decisions? Um, one of the things that I always like to say is our company actually doesn't make any judgment claims as to whether or not something is true. We're just looking at the spread of information and the weaponization of information against different groups. Um, so um, that's why I'm here at this panel. Um, we do a lot of work with everybody from um, democracies to um, large enterprises trying to understand how their brand and reputation is being weaponized online. Um, so I'll pause there, but really looking forward to this conversation. Lisa, you know, I think you really mentioned a great point in terms of the pub, you alluded to it really, the public and private partnerships. Yeah. And I, I think, and, and, and Robin, you know this from, from being in charge of such an iconic uh, American publication that has been around for, for, for more than a century. And that, and that comes down to the idea of wanting to separate, you know, the media and the journalism from the government, because obviously you need to have that type of transparency. But at the same time, when you cross that line and disinformation is fueling war, as we're seeing Literally, the right. war in Ukraine and tracking how disinformation goes from the URL to IRL yeah. on the battlefield. So Lisa, how do you, how do you track that so that it doesn't go from the URL in the digital space into the, the Ukraine or Kiev? And, and, and do you have any case studies, um, that you can that you can share with us, and I'm I'm, I'm sensitive and appreciative of of the confidentiality, obviously, of some of your clients. 
Yeah, um, so it's a great question. So what we do and what we've done is we've developed a technology and a platform that can pull in and analyze disparate sources of data. So I always tell people by the time something's trending on Twitter, like you're in a crisis communication scenario, like we can help, we can come in and figure out what happened. We can do that, Like especially this happens a lot when we get called in to do help handle things like short seller attacks. We can come in and figure out what's actually happening and what you need to worry about. But what we really do is help people to get proactive. Um, the reason for that is there's often, I would say, about a three-week period where, an, where a narrative gets seeded and then it, you know, becomes mainstream. Obviously, there are edge cases to that. So the famous kind of like this came out of nowhere sort of manipulated media situation was, I, I don't know if you guys remember this, but a couple of years ago, uh, Speaker Nancy Pelosi had a video that was slowed down and it made it look like she was intoxicated speaking. I do remember yes. that. Yeah. 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 That's the kind of thing where I'm like, the internet just happens sometimes. Like that's like, <laughs> yeah. that's like some guy in his basement. Like that wasn't, everybody's always like, it's the Russian government. We can talk about the Russian government in a second, but like that one was not the Russian government. Um, so like, you know, I think it's important to be aware that like anybody. That one wasn't the Russians. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Trust me, sometimes it is the Russians, but it's yeah. not always the Russians. Um, so I think that's one thing to just like be mindful and aware of. Um, you know, how do you stop things from going? I like your phrase from URL to IRL. I'm going to borrow that one. Um, but, <laughs> you know, so I should get a commission. Yeah. Get a commission. Call me. So yeah. it's one of those things where it's, um, it's one of those situations where, um, there are ways that we've been able to train models and understand what's actually happening online to do a lot of this in an automated fashion. Um, there are certain characteristics of conversations that flag for us, like, hey, this is going from online chatter to offline action. Perfect example of this, and a lot of the work that we did here has been reported by the Washington Post, but I do need to be a little bit careful about what I say. Um, we, we did a lot of work around what the insurrection attempt on January 6th. Um, you know, there's a difference between um, people expressing freedom of opinion and saying, let's bring our zip ties to the Capitol. Um, it's just, it's a different conversation. Um, there's a difference between tactically planning. And so that actually looks different online. Um, it's happening in different spaces, it's happening in different areas, but um, being able to understand how those conversations shift and morph um, enabled us to be able to detect what was happening ahead of inauguration. And so while, you know, of course, those events happened on January 6th, we were able to identify what was going on and be able to stop anything from happening on inauguration day and the weekend before the inauguration by working with the necessary individuals and in law enforcement at the, and within the government platforms, private companies. Um, and so it really is one of those issues, though, that kind of getting back to your point, like around partnerships, for all kinds of reasons, democracies are never going to be comfortable with governments going at this alone, like insert the obligatory Edward Snowden paragraph. And so the question then becomes how, if nobody's coming to save you, nobody in the government, like they'll do PSA kind of stuff, but if nobody in the government is coming to save you, how can you as a brand protect your reputation, your value, your ability to communicate with your investors, your customers, your shareholders, because all of that stuff is going to impact your bottom line and what can you do to proactively not only manage it, but to be able to win this like digital knife fight that we're yeah. all Robin, you know, when I was preparing for this panel and policing the web, um, I, I'm, I'm a history nerd. And so I, I was, I, I go down these like broadcast journalism, historical <laughs> tangents when I can't sleep at night. And I'm that sounds like, fascinating. I know. I'm such a loser. It's, it's, it's like Friday night. This is my dream panel. I'm like, who can I nerd out with? And, <laughs> but the War of the Worlds and Orson Welles, yes. I think we forget sometimes. And for those of you who don't know, this was when Orson Welles, who's a CBS News broadcaster on the radio, which was new at that time, read The War of the Worlds, which is a great sci-fi novel. And people were freaked out that aliens were invading the earth. And it was because there was this new technology, uh, the radio, that was suddenly popping up all in different people's homes. And it had never been applied to news. It had never been applied to mass journalism and sharing information. Well, I, I think of this now and I'm like, we're having a war of the worlds moment every day with this yes. right yes. in your hand, Robin. And so as you have taken a newspaper and launched a magazine and taken it into the digital era and modernized it as an executive of a media company, what are you looking for? And I don't really like the word policing, but I, I, securing these types of uh, 
uh, issues, for lack of a better word, that we're talking about that will cause mass hysteria and right. worse even violence? Well, it's a great question, except for, and I hate to admit this, there isn't an easy answer. I think that's why we, we don't have anything, right? Because when you talk about most of our platforms, how most people are starting to get most get their news is to your point through their phone. And certain gen gen generations get them different ways, either through TikTok or through Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or just straight. I have a favorite uh, news app I go to where I get it condensed for me from Google News or Apple News. So there's and all of those things I'm talking about are global, not just in the United States. So the challenge of, you know, of saying policing the web is there's there's a few players in this, right? There's governments, there's businesses that are driven for the most part by profit and by what their shareholders want. So you've got to do that. And then there's us consumers. And so it's it's for me when I look at it, I think, wow, this is there's no easy solution because you because I as a as a media brand and a news news organization, I, I actually don't want government to regulate me. I, otherwise, you're going to be like we are in Russia, where the the Russians don't don't believe that, that people are getting bombed in Ukraine, right? So like that's weird. I mean, it's, it's easy to figure out what's happening when, if a government regulates it. We, we also know what happens if a business purely regulates it based on their business model, which is, you know, pick your favorite social platform. They have made their money because they know they want more and more engagement and they know they get more and more engagement based on people going down the rabbit holes on the extremes, right? So that's that's the whole problem. I think the one place, for me at least, is when I think about it, because I have to play on the platforms because I know that's where people are getting their news. But for me, as a consumer, I feel like it's, it's and I know we're not all united in the United States, but I do think we're united on wanting to have better lives, have families, safe families, have security. I feel like we actually probably need to put the the um, the ability to have the power back in the consumer's hands and understand what what when I put my stuff when I go into when I go into Facebook what actually are the five things that put me down a rabbit hole so I get to actually vote with my feet versus I don't actually know I mean and and I don't I don't think there's any perfect solution but I do think us knowing what the logarithms are for them and and being able to choose and say no I don't actually want that I don't want to be thrown by looking at one cat video that all of a sudden I'm seeing you know Nazi cats kill whatever I mean like it's so bizarre how it works and and so I don't know the perfect answer but all I know is I have to play on those platforms because people can't get news unless we can leverage those platforms and it's, it's really problematic yeah let me follow up with you Go ahead, Lisa. Oh, Go ahead. I just Go want ahead. to chime in because I think you're raising a really important point. And one thing I always like to remind people is that the algorithm and the information that you see is based on the information that you're engaging with. So the way these platforms work is they're trying to show you information that it thinks you want to engage with based on your past experience. From an individual perspective, that also means that we can change our own algorithms, right? By seeking out different opinions, different sources. So for example, if you're only seeing like the New York Times, actively go search for the Wall Street Journal and like and follow those journalists too and engage with that content as well. And you'll start to see your feed slowly shift over time so they are mix. The real challenge with all of this though is with the way the algorithms work, um, Harvard did a study back in like 2016 or whatever, and I would imagine it's even more dispersed and more diffuse now, but it's something like the middle 50% of the right the most clicked news source was Breitbart, meaning that 25% was more sensational than Breitbart. And on the left, it was The Intercept. And so the it's 25% uh, more sensational than The Intercept. The cool. real challenge is that never the two shall meet. And so then you end up getting these silos that Robin was describing, but understand that you as an individual have the ability to change your algorithm. You know, one of my first jobs was at uh, post graduating from Penn State University. And, and I I was a freelance journalist for a while, but then I was on, I call it affectionately, the clickbait desk at Politico. <laughs> and we all know these. And what does that mean? It means that I was writing, writing about tweets that politicians did and, and looking for the quote that um, certain bombastic uh, radio personalities uh, would say to say last name, colon, crazy quote. And it's the clickbait factory, you know, and it, and it, and there's, I guess, a, People can have an opinion. I'm not taking a position right now of, of the good and the bad, but I think that when you put it through the prism of hate speech, 
and not, that's not obviously what I was doing, but, but when people apply that formula for horrible, violent, disgusting, vulgar reasons, you know, it's horrible what can happen, Robin. And so you and I had talked about this earlier this week um, at lunch, but I feel that the media has to re-earn the trust of the American public. And, and I believe that, that folks have lost the, tr- or, I'm sorry, the public has lost the trust of what it means to be a journalist. And so to me, trust is the most important word in the English language, and not even just in, in any language. You do business with people you trust, you partner with people you trust, you vote for people you trust, you follow people you trust. But if, if there's no trust in the industry, and I really truthfully think that media executives, not you, but others in your field, have lost the trust because if they're applying these logarithms, so how do you earn, not you, but how does the industry re-earn the trust of the public so that people can feel comfortable that maybe they don't like the message of the news, but they know it's factual? Yeah. And I think, you know, that's such a great question because you know, if Doug, one of my executive bears wrong, he would say, you just have to be, tell the truth and be consistent. But that's, but, but the truth is also subjective based on your lens. So I, I think what you're, what you're talking about, basically, I think there are a lot of factors that come into play, which is there's a, a, a complete distrust in most large organizations and the media fits into that already. And then I think we, they, we've done a bunch of stuff that makes it so they don't trust us either. To your point of clickbait stuff, or, you know, taking money from lobbyists and writing certain things that, that, you know, align up with what their foreign, you know, people are doing, you know, for the lobbyists like without and being still being journalistic. Um, so I think it's a it's a I hate to say this, but I think you actually have to have organizations that are willing to not worry about the business model and be funded in a way so that they can actually have journalists from real journal, journalistic schools and have the rigor and have editors that think that's important and be able to, to not say, I'm not going to do the, I, I, you know, there is some reason to do, to do the quick hits. This is happening, but to do the inflammatory um, and, and rely too much on opinion cloaked as journalism. That's the other challenge. It used to be straight reporting. We listened to Walter Cronkite. I mean, I actually didn't, but you know, cause he's, well for me, but I know to listen to Walter Cronkite and that was street reporting. And now we have a blurring too, and people can't actually tell what's opinion and perspective versus straight reporting. And so there's a lot of factors that have come in. And I think we actually, as a me- as media need to do a little bit better job of articulating, this is journalism. It's straight reported. This is what this looks like. And this is just opinion and perspective. And, and so that, you know, that's what's, what you're getting um, and kind of go back to straight journalistic ethics on that. I don't know that there's a silver bullet and it might actually melt down more before it gets better because people, you don't have an incentive to change unless, I mean, in media organizations, unless it hits your pocketbook. I mean, that's the bottom line, which is terrible to say. Lisa, but, I always say you are what you click. Yeah. I mean, it's like you are what you eat. No, you really are also what you click. And, and so what role, and not just, I, I think when we talk about media literacy, for example, and we, we think of young people. Yes, that's very important. And, and there's data that shows that young people are not as media literate as, as we, an engaged civil society should be. But what about adults? Because the technology, Lisa, as you know from, from, your, from your work, has changed so significantly, even just over the last couple of years. It's like, you know, when I, when I, their Instagram didn't exist when I started out, you know? So how do you, how, how, how do we, I don't want to say educate the public, but how do we educate the public about, about these, the disinformation, the misinformation, and, and, and what Robin was talking about, just uh, opinion versus fact and, and hates, you know, maybe being tricked into going down rabbit holes that lead to horrible places. Yeah. So I think you're raising a really important point when you take a step back, which is that all of that can be taught. Like this is something that we can teach. Um, You know, the way I think about this problem, it's like the house is on fire right now. So what are we going to do to put out the fire? But long term, what are we going to do to make it so it's harder to set the house on fire? And that's where education comes in. Um, The same way that we can teach people how to read a news article. So like you look at the date, you look at the author, the title, the publication, you read the lead, you read for bias, you read multiple sources. 
we can teach that as it relates to social media too. Um, I think this goes back to like, what are we comfortable with? Like, are we comfortable with that being taught in schools? Like, are we comfortable with the government deciding those curriculums? Like, those are the kinds of issues that are happening now. Like, who's sponsoring that? How is it being implemented? There are a couple of organizations that I think are doing a really great job with that. So First Draft News, which is headed up by Claire Wardell and works with newsrooms to be able to help educate reporters about how their, how their, um, Articles might end up being manipulated, how to report on disinformation, that sort of thing. Also, um, the Newslet Project, which is putting together curriculums for students to be able to understand these sorts of things so that if people still have dinner, uh, family dinners, it can also be a family dinner co- topic of conversation. Um, realistically, you have to start somewhere. And if we have a captive audience of students who need to graduate from high school, that seems like a great place to me to start. Um, but I think you're also getting to the point about like, what about going down the rabbit hole? That's the kind of thing, too, where I think there could be an opportunity for social media platforms to play a larger role. So, for example, our company did a lot of work um, around the Michigan militias that were reported on in 2020. Um, You know, I remember reviewing this report and I'm looking at a Facebook page and then I'm being recommended to the Facebook page of a militia, another militia, which led me to a militia picnic where it was like the kind of conversation where it's like we read like a Planned Parenthood rally where it was like all ages, all abilities. We have a job for everybody. We'd love your families to come, like come learn. And it was like bananas. So the reality is like, these are things too that you can put interstitials in and social media platforms are starting to do this a little bit with labeling on certain topics, but that's something that's iterated over time as well. So at first it was just whether or not information around voting was accurate. What is election day? Like that, is this actually a polling station? That sort of thing. Then it became COVID-19 related disinformation. So we decided that we were comfortable with the idea that public health should come with a warning label. Um, you know, I think the, it got, kind of goes back to some of these bigger questions though, which is who's responsible for actually stopping this? Well, like, can I ask a follow up? And I don't mean I, I'm not trying to interrupt you. So tell me to be quiet. Go for it. But but to that point, you raised a really interesting point. Like, if, if, if I think it's been well documented, and we're just at the beginning of the research, you know. And, um, but the, the the negative effect that a certain kind of, of social media content can have on mental health, for example, in America and all around the world. But let's just yeah. focus on America for the sake of this conversation. And. And so I'm wondering, do you think potentially there could be some type of, and I don't know if it's government, I don't know if it's some type of, of, of governing body or, or um, public-private entity where, it, I don't want to say you get scored, but the same way that, you know, FDA has to approve some type of, of, of things that you put in your body, um, and I know this is tricky, but I'm going to come out and ask it, like, if there's a hate blog that is urging death on people or crime against people and they're positing as something that they are clearly not and they're radicalizing domestic terrorists it, or worse, hostile foreign actors else, or, or any, I don't even want to make anyone for that matter, terrorists of any kind. Should, should those blogs be ranked? You know, I mean, can we... So that and and maybe rated. I mean, the Motion Picture Academy rates movies. Why can't some of these platforms don't? Shouldn't they be graded at least to, so that that parents, that young people, that that people know um, what what direction they're taking their URL in? Yeah. So that kind of becomes a slippery slope, in my um, opinion. Right? Yeah. Like the kind of thing where. There, there have been some ideas thrown around there, almost like a nutrition label, so that you're getting enough granularity and that sort of thing. Look, I think it's really important that we know where information is coming from, in the sense, especially when it's like a blog or a forum or something like that. The flip side of that, though, is like, let's say, because the rules that are created in an American context, um, those get implemented worldwide. So let's say, for example, um, the policy that you want to come up with or the policy that you're talking about, which would essentially say, like, here's where information is coming from that are bad. What happens when that's now like the LGBTQ activists in Moscow trying to make Moscow a more open place and all of a sudden the Kremlin knows exactly who that person is? So there is those are the hard questions that I think I don't envy the social media platforms and having to navigate, I think. 
one of the things though that like we can be doing and we can be considering is like how do we give people better information how do we help them understand where information is coming from um those are the sorts of things that i think people can choose to adopt so like for example um news guard plugins things like that to be able to see if something has come up we started labeling state media as state media i think that's a good step um those are the kinds of questions though that like we are struggling as to answer. But some of the things that you're talking about, though, I want to go back to the examples of like, what about like the crazy bloggers who are trying to radicalize people, stuff like that. This is something that I think a lot of people don't necessarily realize, especially like companies and people who have to deal with this stuff. There are laws and rules on the books that you can already use to deal with a lot of that stuff. So for example, all of our work is done under privilege for the most part for this reason, because um, a lot of companies will find so okay, so take the example you were talking about. It is illegal to conduct an act of terrorism. And so, you know, we saw, for example, ISIS using these sorts of tactics back in 2014. As soon as somebody bought the plane ticket, the FBI was meeting them at the airport before they could go to Raqqa. So there are certain things like that that, like, exist. Similarly, when it comes to, like, hate speech, when it comes to, like, violent content, um, you can't threaten somebody. Like, that is also a, an act that can be dealt with. Um, you can't, and a lot of the social media platforms do have policies against these types of um, things that you're talking about. So if it gets flagged for them as a violation of their community standards, if they have content moderating teams and trust and safety teams, they will take it down. A couple challenges here. Enforcement's not even across platforms. It's limited by human capacity. It's not automation and automated detection of this doesn't always work. It doesn't catch everything. Um, and then teams are stretched thin. They're coming from cost centers, right? Like they're, they're hurting the bottom line by even having them. I think the other piece though, too, is some platforms are starting to pride themselves on not having content yeah. moderation. They're priding themselves on not taking content down because it's hate speech. So what happens is people get kicked off of one platform. They go to another where they're meeting more like-minded people. It's becoming more of the like swirl of internet garbage. And there's no, there's no intervening factor. It then moves across the internet, becomes something that turns into a tactical plan. And that's where it gets really dangerous. So the question becomes, who is responsible for the content that's being put on there? And how do we balance freedom of expression with security, with also accessibility, frankly, yeah. to be able to use these platforms? Yeah. Go ahead, Robin. No, I was going to say, I 100% agree with her because it's not, it's exactly what she's saying is really the problem. And I think the bottom line on the, the social media and, and the platforms is even, and I think a, uh, Rick was going to be on the call where he started his own platform um, to have it be a safe place to be. But lots of people have tried that and it just doesn't end up working because just the business models don't work and there's a lot of other issues around it. And so it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting dilemma. I don't have any answers, but I know that from a media perspective, we, we actually, as long as we can report and show where it's coming from, that I think helps the whole, the whole conversation. I just don't think there's a, the one thing I had um, for Lisa is when it comes to your clients, I mean, I know that we're relying on the, on the social media platforms to arbitrate, you know, hate speech, lots of things, copyright, everything. And I myself have to, I have, I think three or four full-time people that just manage our comment section. I mean, it's a thing. Yeah. It's a thing. It's like, you have to be doing it and we have an automated, everybody has an automated system. Even though you have an automated system, you still have to have human eyes on it to then validate and figure out. So it's, it's a big, it's a big thing. It's not insignificant. But from, from like, from your business, what would it take like in your mind for the U S to say, we need that kind of business happening globally for us. And what would that look like for, for all of us that all of a sudden there was businesses like yours looking out and saying, Hey, there's disinformation. And then, and then what would happen? Like, I just would love to see your version of how could that be, be painted different? Sorry, Kevin, I just asked a question. And no, please, that was a great question. I should have thought of it. <laughs> so I think, um, so, you know, I think it's one of those things where every company approaches this differently. Like, so, um, we look at this as like bad guys are going to, and girls are going to be bad guys and girls. Like they're just going to keep like, that's something that we're just betting on, like as a business, our philosophy is 
that people can detect this stuff proactively and mitigate it before it becomes a problem that hurts their bottom line, hurts their ability to communicate with their constituents, hurts their or voters or whoever it is. Um, from our view, what we do is we we have to let the data drive the findings, right? Like if there's no violation of community standards, then don't flag things for the social media platforms because they're not going to take it down, right? But if there's a copyright infringement, if um, there's a short seller attack, being able to attribute where that's coming from, if it's a foreign government, like having that context and that insight will change how people um, triage to be able to do their own mitigation. Um, if there's a specific community that's being affected, that's a key community, you can do targeted outreach um, without amplifying the narrative. Um, if you're noticing something that's out there, you can change the content on your website so that the first thing people come to is see how you support a certain cause if there's something saying that you don't. Um, so there are certain interventions that can be done, but it's all driven by the insights. The reality is for like the really sophisticated bad actors. So think like, you know, like foreign governments. There's a blend here between what we would call influence operations, which is what we're really talking about, and cyber operations. I always say it's the same bad guys in the same office building, but it's different office suites. So there is this bigger picture of ways that people are being targeted, um, and they're using the same networks because these networks take time to develop, Like especially the more mature networks that we find are typically around three to four years before they actually get activated. Um, that's the kind of thing where if you go find that and you go suss it out, it's the same um, network that's going to be targeting U.S. elections, that's going to be targeting U.S. companies, that's going to be targeting climate change conversations or race conversations or any immigration conversations, any sort of like hot button issue. Um, so what it really is, is how can we all collectively understand that we need to protect ourselves online, like period, full stop. In a lot of ways, this is like the climate change of the internet, where if we just all did our part, like we'd be good to go. Same with the information space. If everybody is tracking, then like it's going to be much harder for the bad guys to do anything because the likelihood that somebody picks up on a thread and then we pull the thread and the whole network goes down. Um, so that's the other thing. We're not really talking about, I always say there's no one meme, like there's no one meme that made some guy be like, I'm taking zip ties to the Capitol today. Like it's a slow drip over time. It's networked weaponization of information. So how do we pick up on those networks? So we have, we have five, we have like uh, time for, I want to ask two more questions. Um, and, and Robin, I want to ask you this is, uh, part of the work that I, I do in terms of the research, uh, at the, Center for Tech Diplomacy at Purdue is really uh, centered around authoritarianism and mm -hmm. and and how they're utilizing technology in a much different way. And, and because this is about the web, we'll, we'll stick with the web. But we should note that Web three is already here, yeah. and um, and so that you know we're we're at, I believe the beginning of even another significant shift in terms of technology and the way that we humans interact with it. But um, but Robin. I keep thinking about about the social scoring that the Communist Party of China does. And I mean, I, I, the reason I think about it is because it's really scary because we as Americans hold freedom of speech and freedom of expression. I mean, this is in our DNA, you know, and, and, and as journalists, it's, it's, it's something that you're just it's it's a calling in many ways, Robin, and you know this. And yeah. and so I, I guess how important is it that America get this right? So that because no, but because the alternative is, I mean, is that the CCP? I mean, it's scary. It's like 1984 stuff, Robin. No, I agree. Well, and I, I mean, the obvious answer is it's super important that we get it right. And I don't know that we all collectively, all the entities that play into this, have enough incentive to come to the table and work on it. Wow. And that's what scares me, right? Like it does really scare me that we're not all saying, hey, wow, let's figure out if there's, you know, a way that we can have an office that feeds into everywhere that says this is happening, this is happening. And then all the social networks and all the web, we're able to know what's happening. I mean, you know, I, unless I feel like we just need more of an incentive. And I, and I don't know if that's painting the picture of what this looks like. And highlighting, I mean, your center is doing an amazing job. You guys just did an article for us that I was actually just looking at. But, you know, a, around looking at this is what's happening in these other locations where they do are, are doing social scoring and using AI 
to be able to manage what people actually get to do and say. And where I, I don't know, you know, the sci-fi movies that we've all seen are like actually reality now. So I don't know how we further the conversation other than really amplifying it, that this is what can happen. And here are the four steps we need to first four steps we need to take to mitigate it. And that's where I would think we would need some experts on how do we really mitigate, what are the first four steps we do to mitigate some stuff? Same question to you, Lisa. And then I got one more and we only have five minutes left. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, look, I think we're talking about dynamic threats, right? So like the systems that we're setting up to deal with today's threats should be designed for tomorrow's threats in mind. Um, it's a question, I think, especially when it comes to things like Web3. I think there are a lot of lessons that we can frankly learn from Web2. Like Web2 was a situation where we decentralized control over information, meaning that the internet all of a sudden doesn't have an editor, right? What happens when we then apply that to all of a sudden banking systems don't have a central location? Like there are certain things that I think, and there are certain things like, and there's a lot of DC being thrown at like these tech developments. I think pay attention to about like 3% of them because I think 97% are just, we're in a little bit of a dot-com style bubble right now. Uh, but a lot of really good things are going to come out of this. Like there are going to be things like ha making it easier for communication to flow. Um, maybe all of a sudden we'll have return addresses on where people are sending information from so that it's harder to hide if you are a bad guy. Like there are certain, I think, positive things that will come out of this. The reality is like, I think a lot of times we, when it comes to things like social uh, scoring, like in China, that's terrifying. Like that is something that we need to start protecting against. But I do think that there's a lot of hype right now and around like where technology is at and where it's going. And we have a long way to go before we're like replacing humans with machines entirely, like those sorts of things. So like we still have time and I think we need to be smart about how we navigate these, this next 10, 20 years. And I think it's in a critical juncture in tech development. But I also think like call me the eternal optimist. Like, I do think that we can make progress against these issues or I wouldn't be working on them. It's, it's transparency. Yeah. I mean, but yeah. by the way, transparency doesn't mean that you have a, that you have to let go of your privacy. Right. And, and, and also that word trust, which I think without transparency, without privacy, you need trust. You won't have it. The final question. And I love Lisa, what you said, and I'm Robin, I'm going to give you the last word, but, but Lisa, I, I want to ask you this. Why are you optimistic? Five years from now, we know all the doom and gloom. We know all the fear, but, but, but why should people be hopeful as they head into their weekend if they're in the United States and on a Friday night? Why should they start their weekend optimistic with good energy um, that we're trending in the right direction? Unless you disagree and want to be a Debbie Downer. Go ahead. No, I'm like actually the eternal optimist. So am I. That's why I like you, Lisa. I'm like, I, I – I'm an up the glass is always the glass is an oh, up. Like there's that's the way to live, right? Like we'll figure it out. Um <laughs> look, I mean like humanity has been through worse, is what I'm gonna say. Like we're talking about things like um how is tech impacting democracy? How is technology impacting the way that we interact? We're actually having these conversations, which I think is really important. Like, so I can't speak to all components of the tech field, but what I will say is, for example, we know what a deep fake is before one has been meaningfully deployed in a wartime situation. Like we know, like, like it's not like 2016 where all of a sudden we have to say, wait, what's a bot network? And by the way, half the people don't actually know what a bot network is. It's just like a buzzword that gets thrown around for some folks when it's actually a technical term. It's the kind of thing where at least there's awareness of these issues before we're actually facing them. And so going back to like, how can we get out in front of some of these things? At least we have people who are asking these really hard questions and coming up with solutions. We may not have all the data, like that's actually normal, but like we can at least make the best decisions with the data that we have. And as we learn new things, we'll adjust course. But I think what it comes back to something Robin was saying earlier, where we may all be divided on certain things and on certain topical issues, but we fundamentally still share the belief that we want to create a safer world for tomorrow, a world where we can all succeed, a world where, and as long as we stay true to those driving principles and we understand that's the goal, the question then becomes, how do we build backwards from there? And I think a lot of people can come together around some of these solutions. So that's why I'm still optimistic. One last thing, I'm very optimistic about the state of democracy and, the, and what the- oh, 
the, what the Ukrainian people right now are doing is absolutely amazing. The fact that the United States was able to unite over Russia and say this is not okay, I think is huge. Like, that's one of the things that I think is also different between now and a World War II context. Like, we're actually, there are people who are deeply thinking about issues related to dem- democracy. How do we stop autocracies from gaining influence worldwide? So that, to me, also is cause for optimism. Go ahead, Robin. Final word. I'm, I'll be sure, but one of the same things I was thinking when you asked that question is, I just read a story on, on our um, on our site earlier today, and it talked about refugees uh, or something that had been successful as a refugee and then has turned around and helped other refugees. And I, I think to Lisa's point, like, there's a lot, I mean, the conversation just what's happened with Ukraine we're, you know, we, everyone's talking about refugees and how can we help them? And that consistently happens. I think we deep down are really a good nation and with a lot of really good people. And globally, it's the same thing. I've lived abroad and, and people are people and want really good things. And I think we have the luxury of having freedom of speech. We have a mobile economy that we're able to move around in. We have all these great things in our nation that some other places don't have. And I think we've got the luxury of saying, how can we help the globe be better? And I do think we are. I'm so encouraged that there's so much conversation around what do we do about all these refugees? How can we help them? I mean, that's huge. It's a big deal. We could be to your point where we're too, where there were, there was a problem people, you know, and we didn't let people in. Right. Like, I just think it's amazing that we're, that we're at a place where the right things are being talked about. And that's a big deal. The final thing I'm just going to say is I'm just so, grateful that people like you two are working on these issues. So truthfully, thank you so much for all of the work that you're doing um, and, and, and being such transformational leaders on the, on this uh, digital frontier. And, and um, it's so incredibly important because you're really protecting the voiceless. Um, and, and it's, it's, it's so important and it's a cause obviously that's near and dear to my heart as well. So I want to thank everyone. I want to thank um, run the world and I want to thank um, everyone who helped organize this and uh, especially to our, to our panelists for uh, an optimistic end note on, on this day. So thank you guys. Happy Friday. Happy Happy Friday. Friday. Have a great weekend, everybody. Take care. Take care.